At the end of my earlier video, the clock, Harry O'Mara, owner of a haunted Bog Oak grandfather clock, shared a good laugh with Irish ghost hunter Elliot O'Donnell when he told him how he had got rid of the cursed clock by shipping it to his relatives in Canada. Ha, ha, ha. But what happened when the clock got to Canada? Well, this is one of the things that happened. Every town in North America, probably the entire world, has a haunted house. A haunted house that just has to be explored. Where I grew up, it was an Edwardian mansion perched on the very edge of the Valley of the Sixteen, just north of town. It had been built by a wealthy timber baron as a palatial home, but was only lived in for a short time, and it was never lived in after his family's hurried departure. So, naturally, we had to go exploring. There were four of us, Zack and Paige, who were always attached at the hip, and Casey. And I was there in part for the exploring, and in part because Casey was with us. Now, we had to be careful approaching the place, as even though it had been abandoned for what? Uh, a, a century? One hundred years? It was still private property, and supposedly protected by security. Supposedly, for I happen to know the place wasn't guarded. I learned this over a few beers with my old buddy Trey, who worked as a mobile security guard. You know the old Wolseley place? The haunted house? That's the one. What about it? Well, we got the contract, but we don't actually guard the place. Just stop by in a security vehicle now and then. We don't even go inside or do a perimeter check. <laughs> the place isn't even locked, Trey laughed. How is that possible, I said. Friggin' place is haunted. It's supposed to be. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was. I did go inside once, and you know what? What? All the furniture and everything is still in there. All the antiques. It's like the family still live there. There's even this huge old grandfather clock. But I tell you, the place creeped me out so bad, I got out of there fast. Perfect. The place was perfect for a night of urban exploration. Urban exploration and paranormal investigation. So we crept through the darkness to the back door, and sure enough, it was unlocked. The interior of the house was amazing. It was more like a museum than the interior of an abandoned building. All this valuable stuff. And it was all still there. Why wasn't the place trashed and everything valuable and not tied down removed? Removed and ripped off long ago. Maybe, maybe the place really was haunted. I began to experience a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. No one had really entered this place in a long, long time. A layer of dust covered everything, but there was no sign of any recent footprints on the floor, only ours, our footprints. I heard a swift intake of breath and, looking up, saw Casey staring at an immense grandfather clock. She spoke enraptured. It's stupendous. It quite fills the house. I can't even breathe. It's a monstrous clock. It fascinates me. I had pointed my phone at it, but then she squeaked, 
Don't t- don't take a picture of that, that, that coffin. I turned to look at Casey with a smile on my face, ready to laugh, only to find she was wide-eyed with terror. We need to get out of here now, Casey choked, and I could see she was on the verge of tears. Look, Casey, if you're really frightened, we can go, I started to say, when Zack and Paige managed to disentangle themselves, and Zack bawled out, Leave? The hell with that. Let's set up the Ouija board. Ouija board. Yeah. Or should I say, we? Yeah. We set the board up in the hall in front of the enormous clock. We even illuminated the scene with some black candles. Satanic, eh? I put my fingers on the planchette along with Zack and Paige. I could see Casey was frightened and didn't want to have anything to do with it. She just wanted to leave. Paige asked the standard, Is there anyone here? The pointer moved automatically to yes. Well, I don't know about the others, but I certainly wasn't pushing the planchette. Can you tell us who you are? Again, the little pointer swung back and forth and spelled out C A S E Y Casey 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 screamed. Zack looked at me and said angrily, Were you pushing the planchette? No, I barked, starting to get angry myself. We may have ended up in a full-scale argument, but just then the huge clock suddenly began to boom, and I mean boom the hour. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight... Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, midnight. Midnight? It wasn't midnight. My phone showed the time as just after eleven. Casey screamed. The door concealing the clock's pendulum had opened, and an enormous hand, ashy gray, with long deformed fingers, made a convulsive grab for her. Swinging to one side, she narrowly avoided capture, and glancing up, I saw something so awful, my heart turned to ice. The face of the clock was gone, and in its place I saw a frightful head, gray and evil. It was large and round, half human, half animal, and wholly bestial, with abnormally long, lidless eyes of pale blue that leered at Casey in a most sinister manner. A creature out of hell. A creature out of hell, which then stepped out of the clock. The figure was nothing human. To begin with, it was naked, and it was gray, from head to foot, a uniform livid gray. In height, it was a good seven feet, its enormous round head with a shock of black hair, no ears, huge spider-like hands, and toeless feet. The huge blue eyes glaring with an expression of pure hatred. Not that I had a lot of time to stare at the thing, for it moved with superhuman speed and took off after Casey, who ran back towards the back of the house, away from the thing, but away from me as well. I took off after her and and after it, while Zack and Paige ran off the other way, knocking over some of the black candles in their hurry to escape. Casey and the thing had headed out the back door, and I followed, only to be struck down in a blaze of white light. I thought the thing had got me but it was my buddy Trey, the security guard, 
who had apparently clobbered me with a heavy metal flashlight. Gee, thanks, buddy. Pulling me off the ground, he yelled, What the hell were you doing in there? Where's Casey? Huh? She she just ran out the back door with this thing. Mm, nobody's come out the back door. We heard screaming then, coming from the front of the house, and suddenly Zack and Paige exploded into view. What was that thing? Paige screeched as the tears ran down her face. I ignored the question and yelled, Did you see Casey? Isn't she with you? They both said. No! But before I could say anything else, we all heard a shrill beeping sound. Smoke alarm! Trey yelled. Oh my God! The candles! Zack said. We must have knocked them over or something. Sure enough, the old Wolseley house was on fire. We could actually hear the crackling of the flames and another sound as well, a series of loud crashes and bangs. And suddenly, the huge black coffin-shaped clock was there, crashing across the yard. As it lumbered past us, I saw a pair of toeless gray feet protruding from the bottom. And where the clock face should have been, there was Casey's white, terrified, crying face. We were too stunned to react. We just stood staring as the thing crashed out into the night. Trey, the security guard, recovered first. Go, he shouted. What? I said, still stunned. Go and get out of here now, before I call the cops and the fire department, Trey said angrily. I'll say I, I drove up and discovered the place on fire. I never saw you, and you were never here, right? Right? So get! We got. We came up with our story, our alibi, on the ride back to town. It went like this. After cruising around the burbs for a couple of hours, we let Casey out at the foot of her driveway, then drove off without a backward glance. And, and no, no, we didn't see anyone suspicious hanging around. Although we thought some guys in a white van were following us around for a while. Gotta love that white van detail. So, okay, the whole thing was pretty lame. But still, they bought it. It, it worked like a charm. An extensive search was mounted for Casey, but she was never found and it was feared she had fallen victim to either a serial killer or to human traffickers. The fire was blamed on satanic cultists, who had been interrupted by Trey, who became something of a hero. No one noticed, or was aware, the clock was missing. At first. For, for the humongous coffin clock, began to be seen around town, always in lonely places, always in the middle of the night, standing at crossroads as if waiting, waiting, waiting. I've seen it myself, Trey told me, and I got the hell out of there, fast. And now, now I've seen it too. Standing out on the suburban street in front of my house, just standing there, tick, tick, ticking away. But it doesn't stand alone, as Casey is there, staring at my window, her once pretty face twisted and malignant in the moonlight, twisted and malignant with hatred. They will be coming for me soon. For the moral of the story may be, for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. But the moral of my story is, for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for me. If this is your first visit to my channel, please consider subscribing. 
My name is Warren, and I write and tell original ghost stories and original horror stories featuring such cryptids as the night floaters, werewolves, and the black-eyed children. So again, please consider subscribing. Please help me to reach my goal of 2,022 subs in 2022. I'd also like to take a moment here to welcome all my new subscribers and to thank my dear friend Mortis Media for his gracious and ongoing support. I owe it all to you, Mort. I really do. Till midnight. Cheers. Pictures used in today's video, courtesy of Pix here, that's PX here, while the music is that wonderful ghost story by that patron of the internet, Kevin McLeod. <laughs>